This is WD FM, the official Walt Disney Family Museum podcast. We're your hosts, Brie Bertolaccini, Marketing Manager, and Chris Mullen, Marketing Assistant at the Walt Disney Family Museum. In celebration of the opening of our new special exhibition, The Walt Disney Studios in World War II, we are going to divert a little bit from our present course and delve deeper into that period of Disney history. On this absolutely packed episode, we will hear from exhibition curator Kent Ramsey, director of exhibitions Marina VR Delgado, and exhibition assistant Caitlin Bickle to share how this exhibition came to life. The Walt Disney Studios and World War II is a retrospective of the Walt Disney Studios' extensive contributions to the Allies' World War II effort. This immersive exhibition is currently on view in the Diane Disney Miller Exhibition Hall. When Walt Disney received word that the Disney Studio lot in Burbank had been requisitioned as an Army anti-aircraft base after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, he and his staff pledged to support the war effort without hesitation and without profit. This original exhibition illustrates how the Walt Disney Studios devoted over 90% of its wartime output to producing, training, propaganda, entertainment, and public service films, publicity and print campaigns, and over 1,200 insignias, while also deploying a group of talented artists, including Walt Disney himself, to Latin America on a goodwill tour. During this unique period in animation history, the Walt Disney Studios functioned as a morale builder for both civilian public and deployed allied troops. Walt knew that cartoons would be an ideal medium for communicating with the American people in an uncomplicated and amusing manner about war-related issues and anxieties. In addition to the short films and military insignia produced, Disney characters appeared in a variety of home front initiatives, advertisements, magazines, stamp books, and government posters promoting tax payment, food recycling, rationing, war bond sales, and farm producing. The exhibition includes 550 examples of these rare historical objects in film clips. Yeah, there's just so much in this exhibition. Originally scheduled to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, the Walt Disney Studios in World War II will be on display in the Diane Disney Miller Exhibition Hall through January 10, 2022. A new insignia designed exclusively for this exhibition by Mike Gabriel features Donald Duck dressed as a pilot holding on to the wings of a consolidated PBY Catalina flying boat while soaring over the Golden Gate Bridge. This boat was commonly seen in the San Francisco Bay during World War II. Let's hear from curator Kent Ramsey about how this insignia was designed in collaboration with the Walt Disney Company. The process of getting this uh, insignia was, um, once again, a wonderful experience for me. I uh, let the Disney company know that I would like to have an insignia you know, be included in this exhibition, and I didn't know how they'd respond. And of course, Mary Walsh, who's a director manager at the uh, Art of uh, Animation Research Library at Disney, she said, I've, I've got an individual I want to connect you with, and his name was uh, Mike Gabriel. And he's an animator, and he also was a co-director on Rescuers Down Under and Pocahontas. And so he decided that, you know, he wanted to help out with this. And so we started working together. And the beauty of it was that uh, I didn't have to explain World War II to him. His father was a P-47 pilot in Europe, and he was shot down. And so he knew all about the aircraft that I was going to start talking to him about as far as including in the design. And uh, so we became pretty close as far as our discussions on World War II and aircraft and things like that. And so I said, well, you know, I, I want Donald Duck in this, in, this ex, in this exhibition design as far as uh, he's my favorite character. And he was included in 216 insignia designs. So I said, it's got to be Donald Duck. And now, of course, he's irrepressible and everything. And, and my favorite character as far as Disney, he, he's got a lot of color to him. And so I said, listen, here's what the deal is. I want Donald Duck in an A2 leather jacket with goggles and a scarf. And I said, I want a PBY Catalina in the background or somehow featured with Donald Duck. 
And I also want the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. He says, is that all? <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So he sent sketches and I would say, no, this and this. But what absolutely I was so, so impressed with this. I didn't know how you worked the PBY in. And he had, he has Donald Duck holding on to the PBY landing in San Francisco Bay. And I thought, God, this guy is creative. I love it. So anyway, that, that's how this evolved. And I, I couldn't be any prouder. And I, I just think it's a great symbol as far as the, the exhibition. So, but I thought I got to put something that's, you know, fits in with San Francisco. And it's a very famous plane from the war. And I also wanted to include it because there are very few, if any, uh, insignias that include that uh, aircraft. So anyway, original. That was so amazing to hear from Kent about the creation of this insignia. And the Walt Disney Family Museum is honored to provide free admission to the museum and this exhibition year round for active and retired military personnel and their spouses and dependents with valid ID. An exhibition catalog will be available soon. So stay tuned. That'll be exciting. A lot of good stuff in that exhibition catalog. Trust us. We know. Originally set to open in May 2020. This exhibition was postponed due to the museum's closure. We are very excited for the public to finally have an opportunity to experience it. But how did this exhibition come together? Let's hear from Director of Exhibitions Marina Villar Delgado about how this exhibition was developed. The museum has this project in mind, I believe, since uh, probably before 2014. It was planned to be open in 2016, then it was rescheduled for 2017. Finally, we scheduled the premiere uh, on May 2020 because the, the global pandemic, it was on hold until yesterday. We opened the doors to everyone. First step is to work the curatorial part which uh, uh, will be to, to shape the outline, which is the, the, the spine, you know, uh, of the exhibition. We work very close with the guest curator, uh, compiling all the information, um, building the, the checklist, the object list, researching and putting together all the text for the, the exhibition uh, and the, the catalog. All this information, when we have it, uh, we send it to the company and uh, basically for verification to make sure that all the data is accurate. When we have all this in motion, then we can start the, the design process, meaning we need to do the, the, the exhibition layout, which involves uh, all the participants until the final flow is, is design and desire. When the layout is done or the design is set, then we go uh, downstairs in the sub-basement starts the biggest activity, meaning the registration team starts contacting all the lenders, sending the loan agreements, and making sure that the art arrives safe and stays safe as long as we keep it in the museum and until it returns to the, the lenders, of course. The digital assess takes photographs of everything for um, registration, conservation, assesses all the objects from the collection and from the, the lenders, and do and prepare uh, treatments if is required for the art to be saved during the, the exhibition. When conservation and registration finish all these processes, the art goes to the preps. And, and they, the preps, the, the preparators, uh, dresses the artwork <laughs> to look nice and stay safe in the frames or in the vitrines. In parallel, uh, the designers, editors uh, work in the text panels and all the graphics that goes into the exhibition, including labels, including uh, catalog, all this stuff. Also, the audiovisual team works preparing the clips and the, the interactives that goes into the show. In the meantime, 
in the gallery and in the in the lobbies the carpenters electricians painters janitors take for a few weeks the space until it's nice clean and ready to receive the art and then is the best moment when we do the installation installing art objects and all the graphics until everything is done and ready to go that's a long process but it's very fun actually uh, one of the big challenges were to receive the art uh, to the install the previous exhibition that we have which it was a large exhibition mickey mouse they install and send all the art to the lenders nothing was working the shipping companies were you know locked down so that was a big challenge to get the art into the museum and to be able to prepare that and also it was very challenging the installation process because all the safety protocols we put in place you know that i mean managing large artwork sometimes it requires to people so all these kind of things are been a little challenging but we made it that was so great to hear from Marina about developing this wonderful exhibition. Now let's hear from curator Kent Ramsey about how and why he joined this project. I uh, grew up uh, surrounded by the greatest generation. Uh, so my uncle was a P-38 pilot in the Pacific and European theaters of operation. My father was a Sherman tank in a Sherman tank in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, on top of all that, in my neighborhood, all the mothers, fathers, everybody, the adults, were somehow involved in the war. So my, my teachers were involved, my scoutmasters, the executives that I worked for at uh, Walt Disney uh, were all involved with the war. So I grew up hearing stories and about the courage and sacrifice, and uh, I was just absolutely fascinated with that. And uh, so... And, and I think the, the neat thing, too, is they, every single person was self-effacing. Nobody was sitting there bragging or anything like that. So that's, that's kind of how I got interested in it. And then I just started reading and watching films and everything and studying from the time I was in elementary school. I wanted to learn more about what all these people were doing and get more details. So that really drew me to the, the subject. And then... Um, you know, the, the common thing that I found, too, as I was going through all this material was the involvement of Walt Disney Studios. They touched on everything that I looked at, and I kept going, what didn't they do during the war? So that was kind of in the back of my mind all these years. And then um, the important thing, too, as far as this exhibition for me personally is the, the uncle I referred to a minute ago. Uh, he was unfortunately shot down and killed uh, one month before the war ended in Europe. And I, uh, I made it my, uh, my goal in life to make sure that his spirit was always uh, preserved. And uh, so his story, as well as all the other men that sacrificed their lives, I want to tell their stories and keep their spirits alive. So that's, that's one of the big goals for this exhibition for me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud as far as what everything that Disney uh, did as far as contributing to the war effort. One other thing I should mention, also the Walt Disney company uh the walt disney studios designed the uh, squadron as well as the group insignia for my uncle during the war and uh, our family is tremendously proud about that and uh, you know the uh, disney studios did that free of charge and it's just one of those things that most people don't understand or recognize there were two of them one was with uh, pluto and the other one was figaro the cat and they're both holding cameras because my uncle was a photo reconnaissance pilot and uh so that's they're both holding cameras or dealing with cameras. So, you know, when were you approached by um, our exhibition team to get involved? Oh, you know, that's, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting story. What happened is I'm a trustee at the Museum of Flight here in Seattle. And I decided I wanted to put together an exhibition for the museum that would incorporate, you know, aviation as well as Disney. And uh, so I put together an outline and uh, contacted the Disney company. And just by coincidence, Michael Vargo from Disney D23 was in Seattle. And so he met with me and he liked the idea. And then he invited me to come down to Burbank and meet with uh, Becky Klein in the, uh, as it, the head archivist and discuss the uh, exhibition. And so as soon as I got there, she says, we may have a problem. And she said, the Walt Disney Family Museum has the same idea. 
And I said, why don't we just do it together? And they went, do you want to do that? And I said, yeah, I'd love that. And that's, so the next thing, you know, I'm, I booked a flight to San Francisco. I'm at the Presidio and I'm meeting with Kirsten Kamarowski and we uh, talk about the outline, outline and the next thing, you know, we've got an exhibition started. So that's kind of how it all evolved. But um, it's, it's been a, an idea of mine for about 15 to 20 years. And I'm just glad that it, it's finally you know, bearing fruit. This is very exciting for me. Very rewarding. Wow. So you're, you're brought on to help out as the curator of the exhibition. What was your general vision for it? How it would look? What topics would be covered? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a good question. Um, because of all my studying as far as Disney and World War II, I recognize immediately that all the, the print media, the films and everything from that period, everything was very vibrant. The colors are wonderful. So, you know, I could see them on the wall at the, you know, Diane Disney Miller Exhibition Hall. And so I thought, man, this will be great. Now, the next thing was, what am I going to cover? And the topics I looked at, I said, that have to be in this exhibition. One is the Disney artists joining up. I then looked at training films that had to be included. I thought about the inter-American affairs. I thought about the insignia designs, the gremlins. Um, you know, even print media. I looked at uh, entertainment shorts and then propaganda films. So those are just some of the topics that I wanted to cover. And then uh, wise people at the Walt Disney Family Museum said, well, we've got two others that you might want to think about. And I said, fantastic. I like other ideas. One was including the discussion of uh, Japanese Americans that were uh, Walt Disney Studio employees that were sent to internment camps. And I didn't know that much about that topic. And the other one that I, I'm remiss for not including, and that was the advancement opportunities for women at the studios as a result of the war. Uh, traditionally, at the studio, women were either in the ink and paint or secretarial positions, with the exception of maybe Mary Blair and um, Retta Scott. So anyway, um, I, I just knew that those were the topics, and uh, so we spent the next two years gathering all the information, all the objects to include in this exhibition. You know, I, I think one of the biggest surprises for me is with the exhibition, I envision a wall with um, the, uh, the color, you know, basically the cartoon cells. And uh, so I thought when I went to the animation research library there in Glendale, the Disney company, I thought I'd be looking at hundreds or even thousands of these cartoon cells, color cartoon cells. And uh, when I got there, <laughs> I, I, it, I found out immediately that uh, it was good that I watched Who Framed Roger Rabbit because uh, Judge Doom had uh, preceded me to the animation research library and archives. And what I discovered, unfortunately, was during the war, they were creating these cells but they were also using a dip on the cell after they were finished with it. So Judge you know, Doom was coming in and wiping away the artwork and uh, because they were conserving. They can put another cell on the top of the, the same sheet of acetate or uh, celluloid. So anyway, that was a shock to me. And so they did, they did preserve a few, but uh, also celluloid from that period is very unstable. So if you Look at it today. They're, if you find examples, they're in pretty rough shape, and uh, they smell. Uh, some of them smell worse than an old sock from a gym locker. So they're uh, they're kind of interesting to work with. But um, you know that was one surprise for me. I thought I would have a lot, and I you know you you have to go to the films to actually look at the cells or you know freeze the frame and look at the cells. So yeah, that's a lot of good stuff there from Kent. Once the museum started contacting lenders, it was time to gather research and shape the text for the exhibition. Let's hear now from exhibition assistant Caitlin Bickle about this process. So this exhibition had kind of been in talks for a while at the museum, even years before I had even started at this museum. So luckily there was already kind of a rough outline that was in place and Kent had he had been researching this topic for years as well. So he had had his own notes and his own uh, outline that he wanted to follow for the exhibition. So we start with that. And then as the curatorial process 
kind of gets going and we start our, our meetings, we um, begin to shape the outline a little bit more and try to find things in each section that we really want to focus on and things we want to hit home. So that's kind of the, the starting point. And throughout this entire process, you know, Kent was, of course, always my kind of go-to point person for information and research. And Kent, he not only knows about Disney history, but he's really well versed in World War II history, which I think is a really necessary basis when curating this exhibition. So he provided me with the resources that he had used and different articles and books and things like that. So from there, I pretty much just dove into all of those written materials, uh, went into our, our staff library uh, where we have a lot of resources and found some of those books. And, you know, there's not a lot published about Disney and World War II specifically, but there are a lot of books like biographies of Walt and things like that, that do sort of touch on World War II. So gathering all that information and besides the printed materials, one thing for me that was really crucial to start early was getting my hands on all of the visual materials. So one main source that I started out with was a uh, Walt Disney treasures on the front lines that's narrated by uh, film historian Leonard Maltin. And it's a really great resource because he kind of goes through the context of all of the entertainment films, the propaganda films, and the training films, which the training films, they're kind of hard to get your hands on. A lot of them are. So this was a great resource for that. And besides those videos, Walt Nell Grupo was a really great uh, DVD to watch as well when we're talking about Walt's trip to South America and the Goodwill tour. From there, I mean, everything just kind of branches out as far as resources go. We get a lot of information from our collections team here at the museum. Uh, the Disney Company, of course, was always available and had a lot of great um, information for us to use. And our lenders and, of course, Kent. So we had a pretty solid list of resources at our disposal. This was a pretty major time for the Disney Studios, but not only for the Disney Studios, but, of course, you know, the world in America in general. So, and you can't talk about Disney World War II without talking about what was going on from a historical standpoint in the world, World War II. Um, so there was just a lot of information and we wanted to be sure to provide a very thorough and comprehensive exhibit that covers all of the things that we found important, but didn't overwhelm the guests with information. Uh, you know, the Disney Studios did a lot for the war efforts and each section, I mean, it could pretty much be its own mini exhibition, each little section. Like the insignias, they could be their own exhibition all on their own. So we wanted to cover these topics, but we didn't want it to be so overwhelming that it's just, it's too much to process. So we, we sort of have to work on balancing the text. And, you know, that means leaving some things out, little things here and there, um, covering something a little bit more than others. And, you know, looking back, it's interesting because I think if we had known about COVID, we probably would have condensed it even a little bit more, or we would have maybe, uh, you know, done the text differently in, in other ways, like maybe made it more something digital that you can use a QR code and look for more information, things like that. Because the text, it, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of really interesting information that I know people will want to read, but that does mean, you know, standing in front of a panel for, a while, but I think our guest experience team does a really good job in, you know, keeping that flow and of course the timed entry. So, and the artwork that we have on the walls, we have a lot more in our collection than what's even being displayed. And I mean, that's, that's the good thing I think about us having additional programming outside of the exhibit so that we can cover topics that we couldn't really fully cover in the exhibition. Now from military insignia and aircraft nose art to instructional media for the armed forces, animated short films with beloved Disney characters to government propaganda films, the Walt Disney Studios actively contributed to the war effort. With significant resources at its disposal, the studio devoted a great wealth of talent in animation and storytelling, and also the boundless enthusiasm and patriotic sentiment of its leader, Walt Disney. This exhibition explores the many ways in which Walt and his team at the studios educated and entertained a wide variety of audiences in support of the United States and its allies during World War II. 
Now let's take a step back here and look at how the Disney Studios got into this place. By November 1941, Adolf Hitler's armies occupied most of Western Europe, while Japan occupied a large portion of mainland China and other Asian countries. Due to the war cutting off distribution of American films to foreign countries, the Walt Disney Studios was greatly impacted. Like most Americans, Walt was at home that Sunday morning when he heard, via radio, that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Let's hear now from Walt himself about how he found out the Army was moving into his studio from his interview in 1956 with journalist Pete Martin. Well, that was when the war came. I, I was back from this after I returned from South America. And uh, that was the day war was declared, Sunday. I was at home and we got the word on the, that they bombed Pearl Harbor. Did you hear it on the radio? I was on the radio. Uh, shortly after that, I got a call from the studio manager. And he had been called in turn by the police. He said, Walt, the Army's moving in on us. And uh, he said, I, I, uh, they came up and said they wanted to move in. And I said, I'd have to call you. And they said, call them, but we're moving in anyway. What do you mean, move in? Just move in? So 500 troops moved in the studio. Just like that? Huh? Yeah. I had a, a big closed sound stage. They said, we want that. Get this stuff off of here. We had to move all our equipment. They moved these trucks in to repair the optical things on the anti-aircraft guns. They moved into every area. They had some, uh, we have some sheds over there where we parked the automobiles. They said, what are these sheds? They said, parking for the employees. They said, take them over. They moved in there and stored three million rounds of ammunition. They posted guards at all of our gates. Then they had to go through a whole security check with our employees. There's five, no, 700 and some odd men moved in there. Why did they pick this video? Because somebody else did I don't know. They picked us. And uh, had 14 trucks on this stage because they could close the stage up and work in a blackout. And that's where they were repairing the, uh, all the optical systems for the, for the anti-aircraft. These soldiers were uh, part of the anti-aircraft force that were stationed all around. They had these guns all over the hills everywhere here because of the aircraft factories and things. They were hidden all over, you know. And uh, so I had them there for eight months before they moved out. And I had to, they were sleeping in every room we could. I had to double my artists up in rooms so that an officer could have a place to sleep. An officer couldn't sleep with an enlisted man. And they had their sleeping bags down on the floors and everything. And they set up their own mess kitchen. And we were, I think, two years the government was two years in paying us for the gas, electricity, and everything they used. Two years getting around the payment. I didn't mind. It was kind of exciting, but it was kind of funny the way he said, well, well go ahead, call them up and ask them, but we're moving in. <laughs> wow, that was so incredible to hear Walt talk about kind of getting that call and you know, the studio just overtaking his, you know, beautiful new studio. Um, just what They just a, moved in. They just moved in. How how else are you supposed to handle that? I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't a question. It was a statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Disney Studios lot was taken over by 500 men from an anti-aircraft artillery battalion on December 8th, 1941. Same day that Disney was awarded a contract for 20 military training films. The battalion was stationed on the lot to protect the nearby Lockheed Aircraft Company headquarters. The studio soon resembled a war plan, with guards posted at every gate, photo identification badges required, top secret work areas, camouflage parking garages, newly constructed mess facilities, and soldiers marching the grounds. Disney Studio employees eventually got used to saluting in and out of work. When Army personnel took over the Disney lot, they may have expected to face resistance from a world-famous Hollywood executive. On the contrary, Walt, who at age 17 had forged his birth year to qualify as a volunteer uh, for the American Red Cross during World War I, was eager to serve his country once again. The Walt Disney Studios enthusiastically responded to the call to arms, devoting more than 90% of its wartime output to producing military and government training, propaganda, entertainment, and educational films, and also designing insignia and print media. Film production grew tenfold, increasing from an average of 30,000 to 300,000 feet per year. The entire studio lot 
went into patriotic overdrive, hosting blood drives, planting a victory garden to supplement food rations, and putting on Disney camp shows as entertainment. While the studios acted as a war plant, its patriotic contributions were produced without profit, and some of the work was never reimbursed. Among other outcomes, the Walt Disney Studios' wartime production had an important hand in boosting the morale of Americans during this difficult time in United States history. When the United States entered the war in December 1941, one of Walt's pressing concerns was losing studio artists to military service. A number of them received deferments to remain on war-related film projects, and some even utilized their talents with the United Service Organization, or USO, as musicians and entertainers. Nevertheless, many Disney personnel donned uniforms, one of which, James Berdrero, contributed to story and design development at Disney and voluntarily left to join the USO in 1945 as a sketch artist. He walked into combat zones to draw caricatures and cartoons for soldiers to send home. And at the war's end, Berdrero resumed his job at the Disney Studios. Another familiar name, animator Ward Kimball, remained at Disney for the war's duration, working on defense-related films. His lunchtime jazz band, the Hug a GD8, was recruited to perform at a series of camp shows on the military bases across Southern California for the USO. Something about those Ward Kimball jazz bands and numbers, right? The Hug a GD8, the Firehouse 5 Plus 2. They like to number off in those bands, apparently. Animator Wolfgang Wooly Reitherman paused his Disney career to join the Army Air Forces in 1942. Now a military pilot, he began hauling cargo and ferrying airplanes across the United States for the Air Transport Command. Beginning in November 1944, Reitherman was stationed in the China-Burma-India Theater, where he flew the treacherous Hump Route, carrying supplies over the Himalayas to nationalist Chinese forces locked in fierce combat with the Japanese. After the war ended in August of 1945, Reitherman joined the liberation of Shanghai, helping chart the flight path to the city. He came home with the Distinguished Flying Cross Military Decoration. A special display in the exhibition features Reitherman's pilot jacket and Distinguished Flying Cross that was loaned from his family. There's even a special card that was signed by Walt and other artists from the studio wishing him well during his service. Animator Frank Thomas enlisted in the Army Air Forces in December 1942. With his strong background in animation, Thomas was assigned to the 18th Air Force Base Unit, better known as the 1st Motion Picture Unit, a group of Hollywood professionals making films for the war effort. Now these are just some of the amazing artists that contributed to the war effort. Please explore the exhibition or the catalog to learn more. Now during the Great Depression, hundreds of artists from across the United States were hired at the Walt Disney Studios. This flurry of new talent included a number of Japanese-American artists, nearly all of whom would be forcibly moved to internment camps or felt the effects of internment after the United States entered World War II. This exhibition features artists who worked at the Disney Studios and were interned. Let's hear from Caitlin Bickle about how this research was developed for the artists featured. So generally speaking, the exhibition covers really patriotic topics, you know, the things that were going on at the home front and all the things that Disney Studios was doing, uh, all these positive things to help the war effort. But there, you know, there's a lot of horrors that were happening right here on the home front. And the Disney Studios being on the West Coast, they were affected by these things as well. Japanese American artists were employed at the Disney Studios and they were affected by the internment. And Walt, you know, even though they were basically working for the military, he couldn't protect his artists from these horrors. So it's, it's, it was a really powerful thing. But during the process, we felt really compelled to include this, you know, again, with us being on the West Coast and with the museum itself being located in the Presidio, where internment happened widely. During the war, the Presidio was an active World War II military base, and it was the location of the, the Western Defense Command, which was basically in charge of coordinating the defense along the Pacific West Coast. And so after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1942, uh, Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt, he actually issued the orders 
uh, exclusion orders in 1942 that led to the incarceration of Japanese American people across the West Coast. And the Presidio Trust, um, our next door neighbor, they actually had a exhibition last year, a really powerful exhibit called Exclusion. And it covers uh, Japanese American internment and their role essentially in the internment. So, you know, with us just being here, we felt like it was really necessary to tell the story. And again, like I said, the Disney studios did employ a lot of Japanese American artists that were affected by this. Well, one of the issues that we had was that there wasn't a lot of information widely available about Japanese American internment and how it affected the studio specifically. And we wanted to cover this topic really sensitively and thoroughly. Me, Marina, and Kent, we'd love to get some more resources or find some more information. And we actually worked with a historian we've worked with before, Lucas Seastrom, and he had worked with historian and author Didier Guez. And they had researched this topic and actually interviewed family members of Japanese American artists that were employed at the studios and that were affected by internment. So they had done this before. So we reached out to Lucas and we had gotten his help in sort of shaping this section so that we can talk about it thoroughly and um, accurately and precisely and sensitively as well. So something that really, I think, struck me during this whole process of putting this section together, you know, you think about the Disney Studios and how art, it's kind of fun and joyous and it, it makes people happy. But, you know, a lot of art was created, it is created from pain and injustice and anger. And the artists that were employed at the, the Disney Studios during this time that were interned, I mean, they, they started there, they did their, their artwork when they were interned, they continue creating artwork, they taught uh, art classes, and even afterwards, they went on to do other things. So uh, we have a really great, uh, great quote in the exhibit by Bob Kuahara. And he says that, for them, Japanese American artists, art wasn't wasn't just cultural or practical, but it was part of their existence. Yeah, so I think it's still important to talk about these injustices today with the increase in Asian American hate crimes that are happening in the United States uh, due to racism. And history really has a way of repeating itself. And as a historical institution, I think it's our responsibility to tell these stories to help prevent you know, these, these things from happening again. So it was, it was a really powerful section. And I'm, I'm really glad that we were you know able to include it in the exhibit. Caitlin was so right. This is such an important section uh, to touch on uh, and particularly timely right now. Chris Ishii was Ward Kimball's animation assistant. Ishii was sent to the Santa Anita Assembly Center where he taught art classes and debuted the cartoon Lil Nebo. Uh, otherwise translated as Little Nisei Boy, in the Center Newsletter. As we heard from Caitlin, Tokyo-born Rokuro Bob Kuwahara was one of Disney's first Japanese-American employees. He was also sent to the Santa Anita Assembly Center, where he hosted twice-weekly art classes before he and his family were moved to Heart Mountain, Wyoming. An important story comes from Gayo Fujikawa. She was hired at the Walt Disney Studios as a promotional artist in 1940. She was one of the first female artists hired outside the ink and paint department. At one point during the war, Walt visited the Disney merchandise offices in New York and took care to say hello to Fujikawa. She recalled to historian John Canemaker in 1994, quote, Walt said, how are you doing? I've been worried about you. I said, I'm doing okay. If people ask me what nationality I am, I tell them the truth or give them big lies like I'm half Chinese and half Japanese or part Korean, part Chinese and part Japanese. He said, why do you have to do that? For Christ's sakes, you're an American citizen. Next time anybody asks you that, just tell them it's none of their business. Besides, you're an American citizen. He was so right. From that time on, I just told everyone I was an American citizen but he was very concerned about the Japanese Americans that worked at the studios, end quote. The exhibition features the wide ranging films that were created during World War II. This includes training films that Walt had pitched to government agencies to prove the flexibility of animation and talent of his staff. 
Walt immediately began securing military contracts, laying the groundwork for the production of more than 200 training films over the next four years. Topics for these military films ranged from the basics of specific aircraft, such as the P-38E, to the more complicated prevention and control of distortion in arc welding in 1945. Highlights include 174 minutes of footage on the WEFT system, which stands for Wings, Engine, Fuselage, Tail, released in 1942, a way to assist soldiers in quickly identifying friends and foes in the air, a nine-part series of films named The Jacksonville Project that included the thatch-weave method of aerial combat developed by Naval Aviator Lieutenant John Thatch, an 11-part aerology series on meteorology, animated maps for the live-action film Attack in the Pacific from 1944, for the United States Office of War Information, and a 26-part series called Rules of the Nautical Road, the studio's largest wartime contract. Wow, that's incredible. And President Roosevelt called the movie theater a, quote, necessary and beneficial part of the war effort, end quote. The administration asked Hollywood to ask itself, will this picture help win the war? Propaganda films increased enlistment production of the war materials, and general support for the war effort. Elmer Davis, the U.S. Office of War Information Director, said, quote, The easiest way to inject a propaganda idea into most people's minds is to let it go through the medium of an entertainment picture when they do not realize that they are being propagandized, end quote. Compared to German propaganda, which proudly amplified Hitler and his beliefs, American propaganda was subtler and promoted democratic ideals in a free society. Walt wanted his films to be timeless, but propaganda films went against this ideal. In a 1943 Disney Studios publicity release, Walt voiced his opinion on the topic. Quote, The use of the screen for outright propaganda is resented by our people and I believe the peoples of other nations will feel the same way. That is why I feel the motion picture will be limited in its propaganda approach. After all, one of the things we are fighting for is the right of all peoples to think, read, and speak as they will, not to have others' views foisted upon them." End quote. Overall, the propaganda films leaned more toward education and entertainment. In the end, the Walt Disney Studios' wartime film succeeded in influencing people to pay their taxes, buy war bonds, enlist, conserve critical resources, and increase food production. One very notable propaganda film was Der Fuhrer's Face that was released in 1943. At the start of the film, Donald Duck is sound asleep in bed when a German Oompa band made up of various Axis players marches down his street. Donald's alarm clock goes off, revealing that everything inside and outside his home, his alarm clock, bedding, wallpaper, clouds, telephone poles, buildings, and hedges, features Nazi insignia. Donald wakes up from this Nazi nightmare in his own American bed, and he immediately hugs a model of the Statue of Liberty on a table in his bedroom. Now let's hear from Walt about this film, Dear Fuhrer's Face. I did the fewer space. <laughs> it became a hell of a hit. It was the most popular propaganda film we had. It was put in all languages. They dropped it behind. They had it in the underground. They were underground. Were running it and getting a good laugh out of it while they were under the uh, the heel of Hitler. You know. Another important propaganda film was Victory Through Air Power, released in 1943. Victory Through Air Power, written by Major Alexander P. D. Seversky was a New York Times best-selling book in 1942. Walt was so impressed by this book that the studios financed the film version as a patriotic contribution to the war effort. Let's hear from Walt, his daughter Diane, and Pete Martin about the film. I read the book, and I believed in their power. Uh, it was a thing that I, I felt just went right along with our century, you see. So I don't know why, I just wanted to do it. I just thought, well, gee, uh, if they're going to go out and try to use battleships and uh, all those other things, I just didn't believe it would ever work. Now, to me, and that's uh, where I began to regard my dad with a new look, you know, because he was championing a cause. 
And I, you know, I didn't make I it to make money. American, you know. I didn't hope to lose money. But I made it because I wanted to do it. You know, I don't think we mentioned victory through our air power when we were talking the other day. That's one of the most important ones, isn't it, Wolf? Yes, it was, uh, it, was a, it was an effective film, and I've heard that uh, a good uh, uh, authority that the film was influential in the air power program. And we uh, emphasized the need of strategic air power rather than just, uh, oh, what you'd call, uh, oh, uh, I still believe in that. Strategic idea. against the, uh, oh, what do they call the use where it's in conjunction, it's just uh, another extension uh, of the, uh, I know what of the artillery or something. I just think it's so great hearing from Diane how proud she was of her father championing this cause with Victory Through Air Power in particular. Another important division of the Walt Disney Studios was developing insignias featured popular and sometimes new Disney characters for branches of the military and associated groups. Now let's hear from the exhibition curator Kent Ramsey about these Disney insignias. I hosted the World War II reunions at the Museum of Flight and all around the country over about 20 years. And I think the most, just the most rewarding thing to see was these guys coming, they're like 80 or 90 years old, and they still have their Disney insignia patch. And they're as proud of that as their service record. And I'm kind of just going, wow, this is impressive. So the insignia section of the exhibition is, is, is very special to me. I made uh, two dip different trips down to the Disney archives there in Burbank. And uh, they had like nine volumes of books. Uh, They had 1,200 insignias that I looked at. And I was trying to select about 75 out of 1,200 insignias to work with. A majority of the insignias that uh, they recorded, unfortunately, were black and white. So I thought, how do we bring these back to life? And then I talked to Kevin Kern, who's one of the archivists there. And he says, I've got some color guides. And the next thing you know, we're exchanging information. And he presents me with color guides. I go into Photoshop and Illustrator. And I'm bringing these beautiful, beautiful designs, these graphic designs, back to life again. So I think that's one thing when you walk into the exhibition. One of the walls has all these beautiful insignia designs on them. And it'll be a colorful surprise to your eyes. So, yeah. Going through the archives, it was wonderful to look at the designs, but I also studied the request letters from the military units and companies, and a lot of them included crude designs and things like that, and they wanted Disney to make it look great. But uh, anyway, one of the stories that I ran across was uh, a POW made a request. And I thought, this is the strangest one I've ever seen, and this guy's in, you know, in a POW camp in Germany. His name was Captain Robert H. Bishop, and he was a B-24 navigator. And unfortunately, he was shot down over Kiel, Germany. And so he ends up in uh, Stalag Luft III, which is a very, very famous POW camp. If you know anything about uh, The Wooden Horse or The Great Escape, two great books that were made into movies, well, that's Stalag Luft III. So uh, anyway, he's sitting in there, and he. He sends a request through his, the, the Red Cross and then his wife to the Disney Studios to design a Donald Duck behind bars, and I just want a fly theme. And so the next thing you know, the Disney Studios, of course, designs it, and it, it, it's you know, sent back to him. But to me, that was the, the most original and intriguing request out of everything that I looked at. And uh, I think it's a, a wonderful. Uh, there's also a wonderful picture of uh, Disney holding that in Sydney, I believe, in the exhibition. And here's a little bit from exhibition assistant Caitlin Bickle uh, to share more about this exhibition. In anything that was published or any articles or recordings, audio, things like that, one of the things that I came across the most was talk about the insignias, uh, the designs that were created for the different uh, military branches. And we even had some people during the process would, once they found out, you know, once the exhibition was announced, um, would email us and be like, hey, this, my grandfather had this insignia. Does this look like a Disney insignia? And we had a lot of that. And in general, I think that because that information was a little bit more widely available, 
it kind of shows the the huge impact these the insignia had during this war though during the war about 1200 designs for 1300 military units and i mean they had a whole team that basically worked on this that was something that i got really familiar with um, and we actually, what's interesting is we got letters scanned from the Walt Disney Archives and the Walt Disney Photo Library of letters from different military units written by lieutenants or generals, uh, commanding officers of these requests that came to the Walt Disney Studios. And one in particular uh, that really struck me, and I'll always think about this one, is it was a handwritten letter, really short uh, by uh, Commanding Officer William S. Fled from a submarine Coast Guard submarine chaser unit. And it says, you know, if you guys can find the time, we'd be really, really grateful if you could uh, create this insignia for us. We would display it proudly and it would make us so happy and thanks so much. And then along with this, they included this really charming sketch of sort of what they wanted. And they put little notes next to it, like, oh, you can you can maybe make it this tall, or you don't have to do it like this. You can include this. It was a, a sketch of a like an octopus sitting on a seahorse holding TNT. Um, it's a cute little sketch, but and and then of course in the exhibition we do have the final um, insignia that was created by the Disney Studios and ended up being a fish on a type of fish on a seahorse, and he's holding TNT. So. I think that that really stuck with me because it shows the human side, I think, to the work that was being done and the impact that the Walt Disney Studios had on not only the general public during the war, but the actual people that were in the war, that were fighting for the war and that weren't necessarily on the home front. You know, they were all over the place. And it's kind of an emotional thing because it, you know, a lot of these people didn't make it home to their families. And so, you know, they, they took the time out to request this insignia, hoping that the Disney Studios would create something for them. And then they got it and it's it's a piece of home. It's a little piece of a little bit of joy, you know, in such a terrible time. And that really struck me as kind of powerful and really special. And that's why in the exhibit we have a big section dedicated to the insignia. We have a, a wall of just tons of insignia and you can go through the iPad. We have an iPad that has um, the labels and where all these military units were located. So it's, I, I really enjoyed learning about that section. That's such a cool aspect of wartime production that so many people uh, don't know happened about the production either for free or for minimal cost, uh, those insignias. Here's another great story related to those insignias. In 1942, Royal Air Force, or RAF, Flight Lieutenant Roald Dahl, yes, the same Roald Dahl that was the future author of James and the Giant Peach, Matilda, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, submitted a manuscript entitled Gremlin's Lore to his superiors, which eventually found its way into the hands of Walt Disney. An inside joke among aviators, Gremlins were mythical creatures that wreaked mechanical mischief on aircraft. Disney introduced gremlin character designs and dolls text through a seven-page article in a December 1942 issue of Cosmopolitan magazine. The highly popular article was expanded into The Gremlins, a richly illustrated book published by Random House in 1943. But production ran into trouble on a number of fronts. While the two shared admiration for one another, Walt found it difficult to work with Dahl, who took issue with several aspects of production. Dahl disagreed with the character designs and wanted the film to be a feature combining animation with live action. The animation artists faced challenges attempting to portray the mischievous gremlins as likable heroes. Walt ultimately dropped the gremlins project, that may be why you don't know of his existence. But the characters, including Vufanillas, Spandules, and Widgets, continued to appear in military insignia, comic books, and in promotional, educational, and other publications throughout the war. The Fifanella Gremlin insignia was created by the Disney Studios for the 318th Women's Flying Training Detachment from Houston, Texas, which later merged with the Women Air Force Ferrying Squadron to become the Women Air Force Service Pilots, or WASPs. 
This unique design is featured in special exhibition merchandise that is currently available in our store. The Women Air Force Service Pilots utilized the Insignia character as the title of their news publication, the Fifanella Gazette, with information about the origins of the Fifanella Gremlin and her many mischievous adventures. Quote, Formerly, only gremlins and male children, or widgets, rode the airwaves, it being claimed that the diminutive Fifanellas lacked the ability to undertake such hazardous gremlin tricks. Like members of the 318th, Fifanellas needed only training in order to turn in a good job. When the 319th was formed, a squadron of pioneering Fifanellas arrived with the first gremlins, forcing them to undertake specialists' jobs. Jacqueline Cochran, an important contributor to the formation of the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, also known as WAAC, and the WASPs, stated, quote, I look for the Fifanellas to be a good influence on the whole. I somehow feel that they symbolize a change in the convention, end quote. WASPs did not fly combat missions, but they ferried all types of aircrafts from factories to air bases around the country. They towed gunnery targets and conducted engineering test flights. More than 1,100 women served as WASPs in World War II, and they were granted veteran status in 1977. In this exhibition, you'll see actual uniforms that were used by the WASPs and special memorabilia from the Special Squadron. And that's such a cool story. I mean, you think of women helping uh, the World War II effort, uh, and you think of Rosie the Riveter. Well, now we have another image for you, the Fifanella Gremlin. Uh, so it's just another example of the ways that women stepped up during World War II. Uh, that's so great to see and hear about. Yeah, and I think that this exhibition is so wonderful that it includes so much representation of the women working at the studios, um, enlarging their own role in filmmaking in general, but as well as these stories of the WASP and the women who worked in the military. Sometimes, in my opinion, sometimes it feels like World War II is very manly. A lot of, you know, men joining uh, joining the United States forces to help support our country. But, um, you know, women were so much part of that story as well. And this exhibition really helps display that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. At the end of the hostilities, the studios relaunched with renewed energy. Walt was ready to start making his own films again. Of course, as we all would. <laughs> Although he was more cautious with budgets than he had been in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Walt and Roy butted heads numerous times in the post-war period over what projects to pursue, but Walt ultimately compromised as he missed having creative agency over the types of stories they could tell. Though it might have seemed like a detour to others, Walt's experience in wartime media production contributed to his path of creative experimentation and accomplishment while delighting audiences and supporting the United States and its allies in the war effort. And here's a little bit from exhibition assistant Caitlin Bickle uh, to share more about this exhibition. I think besides learning about how dedicated Walt was to serving his country, I hope guests can walk away learning about how versatile the Disney Studios was during this time and the range that the artists had. Um, you know, they had to drop everything that they were doing in order to accommodate the U.S. military and the war itself. And in doing so, you know, they created all different types of content and artwork that covered a lot of different cop uh, topics that they weren't used to covering, difficult topics, and they made them more accessible and easier to understand um, to the general public. Uh, and my favorite part in the exhibition is actually the training films section, specifically because it shows how technical and detailed that the artists were. I mean, they covered topics in this section ranging from aerial combat to changing weather patterns, uh, flush riveting, which is just putting two pieces of metal together, basically, for aircraft construction. They animated a whole short about that. So I think in general, you know, this isn't a really widely covered time in their history, but I do think that this was a time in history for them that they were at their most versatile. So that's what I really would like uh, guests to sort of learn uh, while walking through this exhibition. Here is Marina Villar Delgado with what her favorite artifact featured in this exhibition is. 
One object that came at the kind of at the end uh, was a donation from Don Han. It's a sailor hat uh, that is signed by Walt and other uh, members. The studio at that time is very cute. I was very happy when Don sent me the photos and he's like, of course, I want this in the show. And then he donated to the museum. So that's a very, I think it's a very nice piece to have in the collection. And what else? I mean, there are so many things, so many large backgrounds, panoramic backgrounds, about 73 inches wide, which, I mean, we never exhibit anything so large before. So I was very excited to frame them and see them up to the wall. Every section is very peculiar. The exhibition starts uh, with the what we call the welcome invasion of the Disney Studios. Probably is that was one of the most challenging times during that period for the studios, and I think I think probably that's one of my favorite sections because it illustrates mainly with personal art from different animators and shows how the women step up after so many jobs, uh, so many artists join the the fight. So it's, it's a, like a mix max, it's like a very personal with those drawings that never has been exhibited before. I think I like that part. Walt Disney has been always well known as a storyteller and entertainment, basically. And probably this part, you know, the World War II is, is, is a part of the history that not many people know regarding the studios. So I hope after this exhibition, the visitor learn how much the Disney Studios were involved in our history and supporting the work effort. Here are some closing thoughts from curator Kent Ramsey. You know, I, I, what I have found is I talk to people about this exhibition that I'm working on. 90% or 98% of the people I talked to didn't know that Disney did anything during World War II. So I'm kind of, you know, this is a totally, it's an educational exhibition. And uh, so, you know, 90% of the production at the Walt Disney Studios was dedicated to the war effort, and most people don't realize that. But I want them to walk away and, and have them remember that, you know, these Disney artists that went off to war, I want them to remember the Inter-American Affairs, I want them to remember the training films, you know, the entertainment shorts, all this information, the Japanese-Americans that were in turn. Uh, the propaganda films, um, everything. I want them to remember that after they leave the exhibition and just realize what a, a broad uh, contribution that Walt Disney made to the war effort. He was a, a, a total patriot. So that, that's kind of the takeaway. And, uh, and I think uh, the, the final thing I'd like to say, and at, and at the end of the exhibition, I think there's a, just a section as far as... Um, uh, remembering the spirits that I talked about earlier. Let's let's think about and preserve the the service men and women that that you know gave their lives during the war. And that was uh, something that I wanted uh, people to think about with this exhibition as well. So that that let's keep their spirits alive. This exhibition is a unique look and an often forgotten part of Disney history. Tickets are now available to see this exhibition in person in the Diane Disney Miller Exhibition Hall at 122 Riley Avenue in the historic Presidio of San Francisco. With the exception of the museum store, the main museum at 104 Montgomery Street, which showcases galleries telling the story of the life of Walt Disney, will remain temporarily closed with an anticipated opening date in April. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WDF Museum to stay updated. Now, this podcast episode was just a sneak preview of this exhibition, so we hope you get to experience the Walt Disney Studios in World War II in person um, or by ordering the catalog when it's available. You can email us comments or questions at podcasts at wdfmuseum.org. You can also visit our website at waltdisney.org to learn more about visiting the museum, Walt's life, and upcoming special programs and events. From both of us, fall in and keep moving forward. 
拜。